church at Corinth, the first one, chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Corinthians chapter 8. Let's read the whole chapter. Let's read the whole Bible. <laughs> All right. Makes reading the whole chapter not seem like so much. Every time I use this microphone, I remind myself I need to order one of these, um, whatever they call the lapel uh, leads for it. And then as soon as I'm done preaching, I put it away or, and I'm busy talking to people and I forget about it. And so, I need to tell Google to remind me to do that. But here we are, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet, as he ought to know. Uh, but if a man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it? Well, that's a good statement of the faith, isn't it? We believe about God. Uh, we don't need a catechism. We just need 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and uh, verse 6. It kind of tells us who God is. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are off of the idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So, Father, I pray that you would help us not only to understand the text, but God to have clear application of it. And, Father, even tonight, the, the principles that are behind the text help us to clearly apply. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you get out and knock on doors in neighborhoods, it surprises you quite a little bit at uh, how much idolatry is actually even in American culture. But it's not anything like any other culture. Uh, I, I think the American culture is the most free from idolatry of any culture that I've ever seen. Now, we have people that have immigrated into the United States and have not assimilated into uh, one of the great attractions that was part of, of our nation, and that is the knowledge of God and the Word of God and, and gotten the Bible culture. American culture uh, has its roots in biblical culture. It's really, really, there's never been another nation in the world like this one. There have been other republics in the world, and there have been even other republics that have been successful until the abuse, until the uh, people abused the power that was vested in them. But there's never been a nation uh, that has been founded on uh, Bible principles, just the Word of God like ours. Our language was chosen because of the Word of God and our heritage. If you study it, it's just this amazing country. But most people today don't know that. Most people today don't know that that's our heritage. And there's a lot of idolatry. Uh, there has always been idolatry. There have always been devil worshippers. There have always been idol worshippers who deliberately do so. But it is surprising to me when I get out and around in the neighborhoods. Uh, when I was growing up, the things that I saw as idols were uh, Catholic relics, a lot of Catholicism. Uh, you know, you see the bathtub with, you know, the lady in it uh, that's supposed to be Mary, you know, standing up right where they put a bathtub. I think it's a bathtub, right? Is that what they use to put the cover on Mary? Uh, give her a little halo around her. Uh, and, you know, you see little cherubs and just little little pagan symbols of Catholicism. And those certainly do have their roots in idolatry. 
But I'm talking about, you know, uh, it's pretty common in restaurants now. You see Buddhism and uh, little uh, idols, different types of idols, Hindu, a lot of Hindu idols. And uh, idolatry has become, even in our society, something that's a lot more pervasive than it would have been even 15 years ago. Uh, it's a, it is an issue. It's a major issue. But it, we as believers, especially the folks that would be generally part of the assembly this evening, you're just not as affected by idolatry as the church at Corinth would have been. Literally, uh, the folks at Corinth would have worshipped idols until they came to Jesus. So idolatry would have been uh, steeped in uh, their culture. It would have been an important part of their culture. And uh, so idolatry is a major issue. It's, it's uh, not just fascinating, but it's, it is worth our noting that in Acts, when the elders or when the when the elders of the church of Jerusalem gave their statement about not putting the Gentile believers under the law of Moses, it's interesting in verse 20 of Acts 15. But that we write in them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Verse 29 that ye abstain. This is the letter to the Gentiles that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if you keep yourselves, ye shall do well. And we saw, we have seen the last three weeks in our study in 1 Corinthians, the pervasiveness and the danger of fornication. Fornication and idolatry were the two commandments given to believers to avoid or to abstain from. We learned how uh, that a believer is supposed to flee fornication and avoid fornication because those... Are that literally is a besetting sin that has an effect on the soul. It's a spiritual effect. Another spiritual sin, a sin that is directly spirit, and I mean capital, or not capital S spirit, but small s spirit, idolatrous uh, sin is worshiping of idols. And there's a lack of clarity at the church in Corinth on meat offered idols. So in the New Testament, we saw two major stumbling blocks to believers are fornication and idolatry. And now we're in a text where immediately uh, idolatry is addressed and there's a barrier principle that guides many decisions uh, regarding, the fa the pra the, uh, regarding other practices in our faith. Of course, not everyone that's being addressed by this letter or who would be addressed in Romans 14 and another passage on, uh, similar, with similar, uh, uh, similar conclusions on idolatry not everyone's affected by idolatry the same way, but everybody had a responsibility on idolatry. And so tonight we're going to look at the problem of idolatry, and we're going to be introduced to it in our text by the misapplication of knowledge. Okay, so as we get into the text this evening, we see one of the dangers of idolatry is the misapplication of knowledge. Uh, in and of itself, knowledge is a positive word. You know, uh, a few months ago when we preached on the doctrine, the biblical doctrine of separation, we asked the question, is separation a positive or a negative word? Now, obviously, that's a loaded question, isn't it? It's a trick question uh, to some degree. But actually, just the idea of separation means rejecting something or moving away. There's a negative aspect to separation. Let me ask you a question. Is there a negative aspect to the word knowledge? Well, it can be. Uh, there are things we, we should not be knowledgeable of. But I mean, read Proverbs and tell me knowledge is negative. Knowledge of the holy. Uh, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Get knowledge, get knowledge, get knowledge, get knowledge, get knowledge. It's commanded that we're to have knowledge. And I would just say that, generally speaking, when you think of knowledge, you think, okay, I know this, and my knowledge is a good thing. And now, look in our context, we're actually going to see the knowledge that we have of is not only a liberating knowledge, but it's, it's accurate. Uh, in verse 1, the Apostle Paul, it, with an inclusive statement, he said, We know. We know. Now, I'm assuming that the individuals here did know, but perhaps some did not know. You ever include somebody in something by saying what you know, just in case they don't know it? You don't want to call them stupid. Say, do you know this? And have them have to say no. So you say, well, we know this, and we establish that. It's a way of saying uh, what you want to tell them without calling them dumb or ignorant or uh, lacking knowledge. But Paul said, we know that idols, 
we 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 know that or we know that we have all knowledge. But he goes on to say, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. He's going to talk about what we know, but he makes a point. The first point about knowledge is that there is a danger with misapplied knowledge. We're going to see what we know about idols in a minute, but the misapplication of what we know is dangerous. Actually, in this situation, knowledge is dangerous. Okay? He says in verse 2, If any man thinketh that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Boy, that's a help. <laughs> you think you know something, someday you'll really know. Now, that's not to say that we all have to you know, adapt this, well, I don't know anything for sure mentality. You know some things for sure. But the complete knowledge of a subject is a different matter than, than, a, uh, than, than a, a, an assortment of facts or having an assemblage of facts, isn't it? I mean, to know everything and know the aspects and the application of knowledge. And here... The Bible says in verse 3, If any man love God, the same is known of him. Now, there's a danger in misapplied knowledge, first of all, because knowledge is always incomplete on earth. There's going to come a day when we're going to know things in a complete way, but right now whatever you know is limited by what you can know or what can be known. You can't know everything. Uh, sometime for fun, go to a large library. And just try in a day to go to every floor and walk down every aisle and just peruse the general topics of the books. And it'll humble you. And you'll realize in my lifetime I cannot know a fraction of what knowledge is even in this one place. Far less sort it out and figure out false and truth and uh, all those things. You just Our knowledge is incomplete. And Paul begins by helping the believers to say, listen, you may think you have a grasp of this idolatry or this meat offered to idols thing, but you don't know the whole picture. You don't know everything that can be known about it. And so then he states what is known. Idols are fake. That's what's known. Idols are fake. Uh, as concerning, therefore, verse 4, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice and idols... We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is none other God but one. So God is real, idols aren't. We know that. Let me ask you a question tonight. Do you know that idols are fake? You know, don't give them too much credit. Not for the wrong reason. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, the idol. You know, I've heard these spooky missionary stories about a missionary, you know, let an idol, you know, somebody gave him a gift of a carving or something, he put him in his house, and the missionary got sick and all these things happened because you know he had this evil idol in his house and the idol had a demon spirit and all this. Well, listen, idols can represent demon spirits. But, uh, you know, a demon spirit's limited to what he can do to a believer. I just don't buy that nonsense. Uh, the, an idol is just, a, it's, it's a carved piece of wood. All an idol is is whatever it is believed to be in a person's mind. An idol is only what it is perceived to be in a person's mind. And their perception is their reality. And so we know that there's only one God and that an idol is nothing in this world. Don't we? Yes. Okay, we know. Uh, we know that. And I, and I want to be included in that group of people that says, okay, so <laughs> when I go to the Chinese restaurant, I'll snatch Buddha's uh, orange and peel it and eat it, you know. I know he's not going to do nothing to me. You know, Buddha's not... Okay, I really... Do. Okay, I wouldn't really... Well, I shouldn't do that. So, I probably have not. But the, the fact <laughs> is, is that... <laughs> the fact of the matter is that it's not, it's, not, it's not real. It's just a carved, man-made something. But it means something to the people that worship it. Doesn't it? Remember being in... Guyana and seeing the man in the morning and the neighbor, the neighbor of Brother Fisick when we were down there and seeing the man in the morning that had a rock, like kind of a almost triangular shape, just rock, but it was just a stone sitting on a jack stand in a corner of his yard and he had his yard cleaned up and he would go over and meditate, you know, and worship the stone every morning, the rock. And I just remember watching that and just thinking how tragic that was that a man was bowing before a rock. 
you know, and, and, and it was sad. And I knew what that thing was. You know, again, I, I've got an evil mind, I suppose. I, I wanted to steal the rock, you know, or put it in some strange place or, you know, do some things to the rock. I wouldn't do that, of course. But the idol's nothing to me. That rock is nothing to me. The, I, it, it's just a rock. You know, but, but to that man, it's an idol. It's a god. It's a, it's a, I don't know what it represented, but it was a god. Okay. So we know, first of all, we saw there's a danger of misapplied knowledge. What's the knowledge that we have? That's that God is the only true God. That's what verses 6, 5 and 6 say. Verse six, 7, though, we see that not everybody knows. Not everybody does know. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now, this individual referenced in verse 7, these individuals referenced in verse 7, can be believers or unbelievers. There are true idol worshipers in the idols in the temples to those false gods, aren't they? Are there people that really worship those? Yes. And there are true believers who used to worship those same idols. And so what Paul is saying, he's saying the reality of it is, is that there's only God. And there's all kinds of lords and all kinds of fake gods in this world, but they're fake. They are not real. We know that. Howbeit, or nevertheless, there are people that don't know that. And on the basis of not what I know, but on what somebody else doesn't know, uh, there's a real danger. Not everyone possesses the same knowledge. So, we see here that knowledge, knowing something, can be a stumbling block. Whereas if I know something and I go into the temple and I eat meat offered to idols and I know <laughs> you can offer it to an idol all day long, but he cannot receive it because he does not exist. I know that, but the person sitting next to me doesn't. They see me acknowledging an idol that they acknowledge. And that's the reality of it. And so that's the second thing. It's a real simple message uh, that Paul has here. He... Not only is knowledge sometimes a stumbling block, but sometimes misapplied knowledge in the form of liberty is also a stumbling block, and that's what we'll see here. Uh, in verse 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. That's, that's another addition about what we know. Meat doesn't make you anything, and meat doesn't make you not anything. It's just meat. It's just food. That's reality. Um... I've come to, to uh, well, we'll get to that part here in just a minute. Let's, let's move on. Liberty, though, the second thing that Paul points out is the danger of misapplied knowledge. The second thing that he says is that knowledge is sometimes a stumbling block because sometimes it's misapplied knowledge in the form of liberty. Look at, or I'm sorry, because of misapplied knowledge in the form of liberty. Verse 8, or verse 9. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Take heed. Be watchful. Look out. Be careful. Now, the, those two words in our English language, take heed, are akin to what we would understand of, look out! It's a warning. Watch out. Lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. A stumbling block is a self-explained word. We don't use it a lot in our language but we've got one in the swale right now to guard our wacky weed out there. So it's, uh, it's worked rather well. It causes semis to stumble so they don't drive through our grass and up onto and hit our sign or up on the sidewalk. But it's meant to be something that, you know, trips them up if they come by. I, you know, have those people, I don't know where they get them at, but I probably at Lowe's or Home Depot or, or hardware store, they have those little round mounds. You ever been walking in, in the grass at night and stepped on one of those little round mounds that are made to kind of encourage people not to drive on your swale or on your grass? You know, you're just like, boom! You trip and it causes you to stumble. That's a stumbling block. It's just something that makes you stumble. It's an, a self-explained word. And 
we as believers are so self-centered and so self-focused oftentimes that our liberty can be a stumbling block to other people. Let me give you a for instance, because like I said before, currently, presently, at least for most of us, idolatry is not something that is pervasive in our culture. Now you say, oh, there's all kinds of secret symbolism and all that. Now, if I don't know what the secret symbolism it is, it doesn't even exist in my mind. All right, let me give you two things that, that uh, I think are unclear. The goddess on Starbucks. I don't go to Starbucks for a lot of reasons. I'm not telling you you don't have to go to Starbucks, but I just, I just avoid Starbucks, period, because it's an evil company. They're just, everything about them is evil, and even on their sign is a goddess. Even in, and I've heard Christians say, oh, the goddess. Yes, it is. It's representative of a, of a goddess, and it's just a wicked company. And I just don't want anyone in our church to see me drinking Starbucks. Just, I just think, you know something? It's a bad company, and I don't want to support it, and I don't want to support supporting it. Uh, here's another one. I said I was going to give you two. I'll give you more. Uh, the, the movies, the movie theater. I don't go to the movies. I don't go to the movies. A lot of Christians do uh, and have the consequences of it. Uh, there's a reason that we call television programming because that's what it is. It is Hollywood telling you what to think about and how to think about it. They're programming you. In other words, they're spinning truth. They're true. They're spinning their truth for you. Hollywood currently today is pushing homosexuality, sexual, all type of sexual perversion. It's pushing it. It's not neutral on it. It's pushing it and uh, trying to convert people into those. It's pushing uh, anti-God sentiments. It, it just pushes everything that is against who I am as a believer. And so I don't go to the movie theater. And if you come by my house, you'll notice that I don't have cable television. And we have an antenna. We might have a digital antenna. If we need to, we can make a television work in our home if we have a reason to. If you want to watch uh, the presidential debates or something like that or whatever. I'm not saying there's nothing good on television. All I'm saying is I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know where to find it at on uh, television. That's really a fact. But I just don't need the negativity of Hollywood. I don't need to be constantly attacked as a believer. And I don't need for other Christians to come by and see a particular program on it that has something in it that they struggle with. I don't need to have them see me watching it. It's just one of those things that uh, usually, now this is to some degree, usually, normally, uh, when I see something on television, the anti-God sentiment, the... Uh, the, the, the problems, the issues with what's being taught or presented usually are glaring to me. Usually it just really stands out. But also I can be affected or brainwashed to where my senses are dulled to it as well. For instance, uh, when I went away to college, uh, we didn't have television in college. I was in Christian college. There's no TV at all. And I didn't have any reason to go watch TV off campus or anything like that. And I just remember... Uh, being shocked when I came home at what was playing in the living room of our house. I just remember it was just like, that's terrible thinking that and uh, realizing, you know, I've seen the same program before and I wasn't as shocked by it. And so I just don't need to be desensitized by it. But also more importantly than that, I don't, I don't want you to say, well, pastor, right? I don't want you to struggle with something and uh, have it on you because you, you see pastor doing it. Uh, I have deferred things in my life, and me would be one of those things that if it were to hurt somebody, spiritually I would defer. I'd eat kale before I'd hurt somebody spiritually. And that's a statement. You know, I think kale is probably the most evil uh, substance on planet Earth. 
I mean, honestly, it's just terrible. And uh, I know that there are people that take and put minimal amounts of kale with large amounts of seasoning and then cook the, all the nutrition out of it and make it so it's more palatable. But the reality of it is, is that kale is just horrid. You know, I'd rather eat the wacky weed from the swale than eat kale. And that's really is not an exaggeration. If I do eat kale because I think it's a good thing, I will take a whole bag of it and I will jam it into a blender and I'll, I'll cram a bunch of ice water in it and blend it and then I'll just choke it down and grimace the whole time and just, it's like, it's, I don't mind taking medicine, but I do mind taking kale, but I'll do it. But uh, the reality of it is if I had to eat nothing but kale the rest of my life versus hurting somebody by something else that I did eat, I'd stop eating whatever it is. That's the principle that Paul is trying to apply here. And he talks about the things bought in the shambles, and he talks about the things that happen in the, in, the, um, in the temple. Verse 10, If any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at me in the idol's temple. Okay, if you have knowledge, is the idol anything to you? No, we established that, right? The idol's nothing to you. No effect on you. But if any man see you, and you've got knowledge, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Christian, it is high time we as believers learn the principle that perception is reality. You say, well, pastor, people need to get real about things. I hope they do. But their perception is their reality, and that's the place where we meet. You know, sometimes we think, I don't have to answer to anybody about anything. You know, if people think that about me, they're just wrong, and they can just go on thinking. No. Their perception is reality. And what people think about you matters, because it affects what they do. Literally, you and I as believers have never and will never operate within a vapor where what or within a vacuum, not a vapor. <laughs> within a vacuum where what we do uh, has little to no effect on anyone else. Everything we do affects everyone else. I'm astonished sometimes at how things that I don't even know I do affect other people for good or for evil. Just what you do affects others. It's amazing what people pick up intuitively and what people imitate, uh, either because they admire you or because they just unconsciously pick things up. But the reality of it is what we do affects others. Parents, everything you do, your kids will do. You ever said, I don't know where they got that? No, you do know where they got that, actually. They got it from you or uh, you know, your counterpart. But they, they, they didn't get it from far, far away. They got it from somewhere near. And so you say, wow, you know, it didn't sound like that when I said that. It didn't look like that when I did that. Well, that's what it looked like to them. That's where people get things. And you and I as believers affect those that surround us, and we must be very, very circumspect because we are the cause of people sinning against their conscience. And when we cause a brother to sin, we have sinned against a brother. And when we've sinned against a brother, the Bible says, we have also sinned against Christ. Verse 12, When ye so sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience... Ye sin against Christ. I was rattling off or, or mentioning in succession some things. Uh, and here's another one. We were chatting before the service about the, the alcohol issue. You know, tragically, a lot of believers are unclear about, about whether or not alcohol is a problem. I don't know how many times in the past year someone said, well, you know, we do, you know, we do wine at our church for communion. You know, we use alcohol in our church for communion. And I found that that's rather common. Matter of fact, it's more normal than not. And, uh, you know, and so obviously the church's policy on it is that there's nothing wrong with alcohol. Now, anybody who's studied the Bible very much knows that there's a difference between the fruit of the vine and strong drink. Knows that, you know, sometimes there can be generic terms, but you can figure out what's being talked about or addressed by the context. Wine does not mean alcohol. Wine means fruit of the vine. Alcohol is alcohol and it's done so on purpose. 
We know that in the Scripture that there was alcohol, there was strong drink, and that is pervasive. We know what the Bible says about it. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You know, there's another principle about alcohol, though, that, you know, I just wish believers would embrace. Well, you know, you, some people just can't handle it. You know, I mean, you just, you know, if, you, if you're going to be an alcoholic, you shouldn't drink. You know, I've heard that nonsense I don't know how many times. You know, if there were no drinking, nobody would be tempted to imitate drinking. You know, and the fact is that if the Bible had nothing to say about alcohol, common sense would say some things to me about it. Just would. Dealing with believers that are being destroyed by it says enough to me to say, you know what, they don't need me drinking if they can't drink. They just don't need me doing it. Um, you ever done something just to tease somebody, just to be mean to them? Somebody's on a diet. They cut certain things out of their out of their diet. And so you have something in front of them that you know that they would enjoy. Whatever it is, whatever the fatal food for them is, you buy it. And you offer it. Well, you want some? And you eat it in front of them. You know, that I guess maybe that's funny with friends or in context. Uh, I can see where there could be some humor in it, but the reality of it is if you're really trying to hurt somebody, or if you're really doing something that could hurt somebody, that's sin. It's just sin. And a believer who understands how pervasive and how deadly drinking is. You know, I grew up, um, I grew up with a, a friend my brother's age, a year and a half younger than me, who had no father from the time he was uh, three years old because he was hit by an 18-year-old that got drunk. I knew, uh, I knew uh, from a distance that 18-year-old after he did a year in prison and was on probation for most of his young adult life. And I knew what a wreck his life became because he killed this family's husband and father. I knew the children that were raised fatherless, the wife that had no husband. And I'll be honest with you, I just wouldn't drink because of that. I, just, I think it's cruel to someone who's lost a father and a spouse to make light of something that killed their spouse. Was it Shakespeare says that he's a fool who puts a thief in his mouth to steal his brain? Or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and the reality of it is, is that uh, believers don't need to see pastor saying, well, it's a matter of liberty. It's not a matter of liberty, by the way. But allowing that it were, they don't need to see anybody in this church drinking. Allowing that the Bible doesn't have anything to say about it, they don't need to see anyone doing it because it's so destructive to families and to our culture and to uh, children and to parents and to uh, uh, husbands and wives. It literally is evil. You know, idols are evil even if they're not real. Idol worship's evil. And we don't need to be involved with it even from a distance. And so the conclusion in the... Uh, actually, in my notes, it says conclusino. <laughs> my O and N got mixed around. I just saw that. I love typing errors that make great new words. Conclusino. Uh, the misapplication of liberty can cause both the ignorant brother and the knowledgeable man both to sin. You can sin against your brother even having knowledge that something's not wrong. And your brother can sin because in his conscience it's wrong, but he does it because of you. And when you sin against your brother, the Bible says that you sin against Christ. Verse 11, Through thy knowledge, this is the conclusino, through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin also against Christ. Who are you hurting? You ever see a bully? Bully somebody's children when the parents are there? Not very often, huh? <laughs> Bully's always afraid uh, when the parents are around. Um, 
You know, sometimes we forget whose children our brethren are when we ignore their vulnerabilities or we trample on them with our liberties. And we forget that they are individuals for whom Christ shed His blood. And God loves your brethren very much. And when you lead them to sin, or when you wound their conscience, and they are tempted to sin, you have sinned against Christ. And that is a dangerous position for a believer to find themselves in. I don't like Christmas trees. Not because I don't think they look nice or smell nice. My wife likes Christmas trees. Uh, but there are just enough people that it's an idol to that for me, I just am not real comfortable with Christmas trees. I, you say, Pastor, you think Christmas trees are wrong? You know, when you read the description in the Old Testament of what is done with a Christmas tree, that's not what Christians do when they bring in a greenery at Christmas time and so forth. But you know what? I'm not going to die for a Christmas tree. And I'm not going to sin against a brother for a Christmas tree. Now you can say, well, Pastor, it's just because you don't want to buy one and you don't want to have to set it up so it's a cop-out for you being lazy. Well, don't tell anyone that. The other reason is also because I think that it can, it is something in other people's minds. And so it can be a danger to them. And we as believers don't have permission to do things which hurt other brethren. In Romans, we're told not to use liberty for an occasion to the flesh. In 1 Corinthians 8, we're told that liberty actually isn't liberty because of our brother who can be caused to sin. So is it okay to eat meat offered to idols? Well, it's expressly forbidden in Acts 15. And we're helped to understand the reason behind it. Now let me ask you a question. If it was already established in Acts around the same time, why do we see this perspective on it in 1 Corinthians? You ever ask that question? Why do we see the perspective of harm for a brother? I'll tell you why. Because it's not limited to this topic. It's limited to anything that can hurt a brother or sister spiritually. See, what Paul is explaining here is not meat offered to idols. What he's explaining here is the principle of knowledge that you have being used for liberty and the principle that you do not have the liberty to use your knowledge in a way that could lead your brother or sister to sin. And the conclusion is, if your brother or sister sins, you have sinned against them, and you have sinned against Christ. So you can have knowledge that you're free to eat meat offered to idols, but if you do it, it's sin. There are things that a believer could do. There's just a laundry list of things that a believer could do, but he ought to have a strong enough set of principles to understand it's not worth it. It's not worth causing harm to a brother. We ought to have principles in the area of dress that take this principle and apply it. We ought to have principles in the area of places that we go. We ought to have principles in the things uh, that are in our homes. Everything we as believers do ought to be evaluated with, evaluated with this principle. Does it harm a brother? Is this a weakness to a brother? I've told the story many times, but I'll tell it again as, as we finish up this evening. I told the story about an individual we had in our church some years past. We used to, after a long day on Sundays, we would all go down to the McDonald's on Federal Highway and eat cheeseburgers because they had hamburgers for, what, were they 39 cents? And then cheeseburgers were like 59 cents? Something like that. And we would go there on Sunday night, buy a big platter of hamburgers, and a bunch of fries, and we just put them all on the tables, and we would eat hamburgers and fries, and the Huckabee show was on, on Fox, and we'd watch Mike Huckabee uh, after church on Sunday nights. 
I had a guy that said, you know, Pastor, is something bothering me, I need to talk to you. I had no idea what it was, but it ended up being that. He said, it just bothers me that we go to McDonald's on the Lord's Day and eat hamburgers and watch the Huckabee show. And he said, I just don't think we should be doing that. And I enjoyed eating hamburgers, really the cheeseburgers, and watching the Huckabee show and just having the fellowship on Sunday nights. I liked it. And um, I didn't want to stop doing that. Just I just thought, ah. But you know what? It was a stumbling block to the brother. So you know what we did? We stopped going to McDonald's on Sunday nights and eating hamburgers and watching the Huckabee show. Because our brother's more important than hamburgers and the Huckabee show. You know, sometimes Christians will die. I mean, they, they will reject. They, they will kill a brother before they'll give up something stupid. Before you give up your favorite musician, you'll quit going to a church. Or before you, whatever, 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 before you stop watching this person on television that has a doctrinal problem, you, you'll, you'll just kill, you'll crucify a brother. Everything we do as believers affects and hurts other people. You have knowledge. It isn't complete unless you understand that your knowledge can be used to do harm to a brother. And we do not as believers have liberty to do as we please because the Bible says when we do, we sin against our brother and we sin against Christ. You just don't hear that talk very much, do you? Not enough. Father, help us to have real knowledge. The kind that shows, demonstrates that we have a love of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take some prayer requests tonight.